Have you ever wondered what's next for you in this ever-changing world of work? Well, I've got some exciting news for you because today's sponsor is Skillshare, here to help you redefine work and find new possibilities in your creative career. You know, the old ways of working aren't cutting it anymore. You've been hustling and sacrificing your work-life balance, but where has that really gotten you? It's time to break free from the idea that work is everything and embrace something better, and Skillshare can show you how. Skillshare is the ultimate hub for self-starters. Whether you're a self-taught learner, a career changer, or an expert side hustler, Skillshare's got your back. It's all about taking ownership of your career path and exploring new skills and opportunities. So what's your goal? Are you looking to break into a creative industry, find your creative voice, or maybe launch your own business? Skillshare has hundreds of career-focused classes that can help you reinvent your goals and yourself. It's not just about photography and video editing, although they do have amazing classes in that as well. And speaking of goals, Skillshare doesn't just teach you the theory, it helps put your newfound knowledge into practice. I've learned so much about time management, personal branding, video marketing from them, particularly productivity and time management is a section of Skillshare that I particularly enjoyed. I always love leveling up that for me. Now here's the best part. Skillshare is offering the first thousand people watching this today to use the link below and get a one month free trial. An entire month to explore the incredible class library and redefine your work and achieve a new goal this year. So don't miss out. Join me on Skillshare. Unlock the future of work. Click the link in the description below to get started. Again, this video is sponsored by Skillshare, so big shout out to them for supporting creators like me. And uh, now today's video. If someone told you to walk like an Egyptian, chances are you know the exact pose that they're referring to. Torso forward, head sideways, one foot behind the other, arms bent into a Z shape. Bonus points for shuffling forward while rocking your arms back and forth, accompanied by that stereotypically Egyptian melody, variously known as the Arabian Rift or Snake Charmer Song. Over the years, this bizarre pose and gait have become inextricably linked with ancient Egypt, appearing in countless cartoons, illustrations, films, and other pieces of popular media. But did the ancient Egyptians actually walk like that? And if so, why? The answer, it may not surprise you to hear, is no. But like all myths and stereotypes, this one does contain a small kernel of truth. In this case, the peculiarly stylized manner in which ancient Egyptian art depicted the human form. So why did they do this? Nowadays, we're used to art, even highly abstracted, art hewing to a certain kind of realism. We expect objects to look roughly as they would in real life, following the rules of perspective. Only certain sides are visible, closer objects are larger than more distant objects, etc. However, this kind of realistic representation is a fairly recent development in art, with the use of a mathematically accurate perspective dating to the early 15th century. Prior to this, artists, particularly those creating religious artwork, often had different priorities and followed different artistic rules. For example, size was often used to convey the relative importance of subjects within a work rather than their physical relation to one another. In early Christian depictions of biblical scenes like the Nativity or the Last Supper, for example, the figure of Jesus, both as a baby and as an adult, often dwarfs those around him. This convention was also used by the ancient Egyptians, along with a long list of other culturally specific rules. It is important to point out that artists in ancient Egypt filled a very different role than they do today, producing works not as a means of individual self-expression, but for religious or political purposes. The images painted or carved onto the walls of ancient palaces served a wide variety of practical functions, such as glorifying the pharaoh, praising the gods, or guiding the spirit of the deceased to the afterlife practical functions. The Egyptians believed that the written words and visual images could perform magic and that the correct execution of such works was vital to obtaining the desired effect. For example, drawings or sculptures of foods left in tombs were supposed to magically become real in order to nourish the deceased in the afterlife. Artisans were thus not seen as creative and expressive individuals, but rather highly skilled craftsmen or copyists tasked with carrying out the instructions of the creator god Ptah, who had already laid out the conventions of ritual artwork in exacting detail. These conventions included how to write down hieroglyphics, what specific colors to use for certain subjects, and how to represent the human form. Ancient Egyptian art Artisans prioritized narrative clarity and ideal forms over absolute realism, and thus depicted human figures with their chest facing outward toward the viewer and their head, legs, and arms in profile. The extremities were also depicted identically, with figures having two left or two right hands or feet. While physically awkward, such poses allowed the most important features of the body to be simultaneously represented in their most immediately recognizable forms, something that would be impossible in a more realistic rendering. Objects and scenes were also not layered atop one another but rather placed beside each other in linear horizontal fields known as registers. Layering and non-horizontal compositions were very rare and typically only used to convey chaotic scenes like battles. Thus, in their minimalism, formality, and linearity, Egyptian two-dimensional art has much more in common with modern comic strips. 
both seek to convey a particular scene or narrative as clearly and as unambiguously as possible. Three-dimensional Egyptian statuary also followed a strict set of conventions. Male figures were typically depicted in a peculiar, rigid, striding pose with the head gazing forward, the arms pointing stiffly downward, and the left foot forward. This pose was intended to convey strength, vitality, intelligence, and will, while the left foot was favored as it lay on the same side of the body as the heart, the seat of the soul, and the most important organ in Egyptian mythology. Women, by contrast, were typically depicted with their feet together, conveying their more passive and supportive role in Egyptian society. When sculpted seated or laying down, people are typically either with their hands resting on their legs or with one or both arms crossed over their chests. Pharaohs depicted in this manner typically hold in their hands the shepherd crook and the flail, the traditional royal symbols which represent respectively the pharaoh's leadership of his people and the fertility of the land guaranteed by his divine rule. The cross-armed posture is especially common in funerary art, while mummies were often posed with their arms in this position. This was intended did to echo the traditional depiction of Osiris, god of the underworld. Interestingly, this posture may have been inspired by the so-called Lazarus sign, a common and totally not creepy at all to witness phenomenon whereby a brain-dead person will reflexively raise their arms and cross them over their chest. Despite being subject to a whole canon of rules and conventions, sculptural depictions of ancient Egyptian people tended to be more realistic than painted ones, with more accurate anatomical details and individually recognizable features. The reason for this uh, was also religious in nature. The ancient Egyptians believed that in order to cross over to the afterlife, a person's effective spirit, or Ach, required a vessel to inhabit. Typically, this role was filled by the deceased's body itself, which is why the ancient Egyptians preserved bodies via the process of mummification. But in case something happened to their body, the deceased were often provided with a realistic-looking statue of themselves in which their Ach could immediately recognize and inhabit. But while the conventions of Egyptian artwork remained remarkably unchanged for thousands of years, this doesn't mean there was no innovation or evolution. One of the greatest periods of artistic innovation took place during the reign of the pharaoh Amenhotep IV, better known as Akhenaten. Breaking radically from tradition, Akhenaten abandoned the old Egyptian pantheon of gods and established a monotheistic religion centered around a sun god known as the Arten. In 1346 BCE, he also moved the capital city from Thebes to a site in southern Egypt now known as Tel el Amarna, hence his reign is typically known as the Amarna period. Along with the changing religion, artwork during the Amarna period experienced a dramatic shift in style. The rigid formalist style of the past gave way to a more organic naturalist style, with male figures being given more feminine features such as longer heads and faces, fuller lips and larger hips, stomachs and breasts. Arms, legs, feet and hands were rendered in greater detail with figures depicted with both right and left hands and feet. The type and composition of images also changed radically. Figures were shown participating in a wide variety of dynamic activities, while the pharaoh and his family were depicted in more naturalistic and intimate domestic scenes rather than rigid power poses. However, despite these innovations, much of the old formalism still remained, with figures still being depicted in the same awkward chest-forward style as before, and sadly, this flourishing of creativity was not to last. Following his death in 1336 BCE, Akhenaten was declared a heretic, and the old Egyptian pantheon was quickly restored, and with it, the old formal style of ritual art. By the time Akhenaten's successor, Tutankhamun, took the throne in 1332 BCE, nearly all traces of the Amarna style had disappeared. Yet despite the wide variety of scenes and activities depicted in ancient Egyptian art, from religious rituals to beer brewing to sports and warfare, one pose is conspicuously absent. The stereotypical Z-shaped Egyptian walk. So where then did this pose come from? Unfortunately, the answer has been lost to history, though as the earliest depictions of this pose or dance come from the early 20th century, it likely originated during one of the many Egyptomania crazes that swept the Western world during this period. Indeed, it is around this time that the familiar Arabian riff, or snake charmer song, that stereotypically accompanies the Egyptian walk first came to prominence, the tune being used to accompany a widely popular belly dancing act during the 1893 Chicago World's Columbian Exposition. The tune went on to become a popular hit, being republished on the various titles, including The Streets of Cairo, The Hoochie Coochie Dance, and The Southern Part of France. But the tune did not originate at the fair, having appeared in the Arabian song in French composer Jean-Baptiste Arbaz's 1864 Complete Conservatory Method for Trumpet. But just where the tune originated prior to this is also a mystery, with most music historians believing that it was adapted from a traditional Algerian melody called Kardotia. 
Whatever the case, just like the idea that Vikings wore horned helmets originated with the production designer for one of Wagner's operas, it's more likely that the Egyptian dance was the fanciful, orientalist creation of some early 20th century choreographer. As for where the Bangles came about their quirky 1986 hit, the story goes that songwriter Liam Sternberg was sailing across the English Channel when the ferry encountered rough water. Struggling to keep their balance, his fellow passengers jerked their arms and legs outward in poses that reminded Sternberg of ancient Egyptian paintings. After scribbling down the words walk like an Egyptian in his notebook in 1984, Sternberg composed the rest of the song and recorded a demo with Marty Jones on vocals and percussion performed on kitchen utensils. After being offered to and rejected by Tony Basil of Mickey fame, the demo caught the attention of producer David Kahn, who convinced the Bangles to record it and include it on their 1986 album Different Light. And the rest, as they say, is history.